2. The printer looked like a poised insect. It was finished in textured grey plastic with the B&I logo of the Butler Institute embossed on it. It stood on the table on slender legs, bent over its own shadow, its torso formed by the flat box shape of the paper cartridge. The cartridge was angled down so that each emerging sheet of paper slid gently out onto the surface of the table. Matthew O'Hara picked up the first sheet as it hissed from the machine, waited for the second, then carried them with him into the kitchen. The paper was still warm. O'Hara sat down with a fresh cup of coffee at the counter and started reading. He liked having a hard copy to read. The same information could be gleaned off a computer screen, but there was something about actually having it in his hand which helped him to concentrate. A small eccentricity. A minor vice. He supposed it was a waste of paper and therefore of trees, although of course that didn't matter anymore. O'Hara sipped his coffee and read. The house was quiet around him. He and his wife had spent the evening with their young son Patrick. A family evening, Anne-Marie called it. They'd watched television together. Then they'd given Patrick his bath and put him to bed. After that, Anne-Marie and O'Hara had gone to bed themselves and made love. Afterwards, O'Hara lay in the dark bedroom, waiting patiently until his wife had fallen asleep. Then he had come downstairs to work. There was still a lot to be done. O'Hara skimmed quickly through the day's reports from the construction crews. Cost and target completion estimates. A memo about pilfering from the canteen. A report about a fight that had broken out between the Korean and Japanese technical teams. A request for better surveillance hardware after one of the perimeter cameras had been smashed by a boy with a slingshot. Through the windows of the kitchen, O'Hara could see the dark shapes of trees and the occasional flash of light through them. He reflected that trees like this had once covered the slopes of these mountains. He had a sense of history, an important quality in a man who had a task like his. At his wife's request, O'Hara had interfered with the clearing of the mountain and had preserved the last few trees nearest the house. As it turned out, it wasn't a bad idea. The trees acted as a barrier to the sound of construction that continued day and night further down the mountain slope. O'Hara watched the intermittent lights of earth moving machinery through the trees. He found the sight reassuring. Finally, he looked back at the papers in front of him. On top were two pages of notes, one headed Catasan, the other Lindhurst. He put these away and turned to the remaining papers. The two sheets were personnel records. On the top right-hand corner of each was a photograph. The name on the top of one sheet was Mancuso Tessa Ann. On the other, it was McKilveen, James Haynes. Both the man and woman in the photographs wore police uniforms. The emblem of one of the New York City police services ran down the side of each sheet of paper. O'Hara left the documents on the counter and wandered out of the kitchen, taking his coffee with him. In the living room, he settled onto the black, silk-covered couch and put his feet up. He let the matter of the decision fade from his mind. His subconscious could worry away at the problem for him. On, said O'Hara to the empty room. In a dark corner by the stone fireplace, a small blue light snapped on, showing the outlines of a stack of flat black boxes. There was a faint, transient hum as the Bang & Olsen system came to life. Television, said O'Hara. A second blue light came on at the side of a second flat box. News interpreter, said O'Hara. There was a pause as the B&O analysed news broadcasts of the last 24 hours, choosing or discarding information according to O'Hara's recorded preferences. A small shutter opened silently, and the dim light from the kitchen was caught and reflected on the precision glass of the projector's lens. O'Hara lay back, sipping his coffee and watching the hologram take shape on the dark carpet near the couch. Further back, he said. Patrick had been playing with the settings. The boy always sat too close to the television. The glowing patch skipped back to the normal viewing position. 
in the centre of the carpet, halfway between the couch and the fireplace. A little further, said O'Hara, and it was just as well he did. Even so, he almost poured his coffee in his lap when the image snapped into sharp focus and the tall, thin figure came racing across the carpet towards him. O'Hara knew it was just a hologram, but he found himself drawing his legs up close to his chest in a quick, involuntary move. He was cowering among the cushions as the figure strode back and forth on the carpet, as close to the couch as his chosen viewing distance would allow it to get. Jack Blood stood leering at him in the half-light. The big, misshapen pumpkin that formed his head nodded forward and twisted as though watching O'Hara. His greasy black undertaker's suit flapped around his thin scarecrow body. The long black twigs of his fingers were wrapped around the handles of two long-bladed butcher's knives, which Jack dropped together slowly. There was no sound as the blades met. That was because O'Hara's young son had sampled the image, copying it from his favourite television programme, but the Bang and Olfsen hadn't let him tamper with the sound. News interpretation, said Jack, the voice coming out of his crudely carved jack-o'-lantern mouth. Selection taken according to the profile set on August 10th this year. The voice was soft, cultured, with a slight European accent. It belonged to the attractive grey-haired woman who usually presented the news interpretation on the B&O. O'Hara sighed, straightening out on the couch and relaxing again. Now he would have to read the damned manual and find out how to return the image to its factory setting. International news summary, said Jack Blood, a small worm crawling out of one empty, deep-carved eye socket. The pumpkin-headed mass murderer was a modern phenomenon. Sociologists wrote books about his universal appeal. His television creators were engagingly modest about the whole thing. They'd just set out to create a good Saturday morning show. O'Hara moved on the couch so he wouldn't have to watch the worm's progress. Jack moved his head in synchronisation, tracking inexorably, offering O'Hara the best presentation of image to go along with the lifelike stereo sound. Increasing instability in weather patterns. Skip, said O'Hara. Fighting in Indonesia. Skip, said O'Hara. Analysis of seawater in a skip, a report on environmental skip, an article describing telekinetic skip, N no, wait a minute, said O'Hara. Repeat the last item. From the London Sunday Times, Science and Technology section, 7th of this month. Headline, Bloody Strange. Main text to feature as follows. The Sunday Times Insight team has learned that biochemistry boffins are baffled by an article written by Srila Govindia. A highly respected scientific journalist, Dusky Beauty Srila is just summarise, said O'Hara. The article goes on to describe how certain blood proteins may indicate the presence of strange mental powers in human beings. Explain, said O'Hara. What kind of powers? No more information available. Strange mental powers, repeated the pumpkin-headed horror. OK, hold it, said O'Hara. He thought for a moment. Link with the office computer. Link established, said Jack, waving his sticky bladed knives. Cross-reference with that news item. Find out the location of the scientific journalist and ask her to fly out to New York. Book a company apartment at the King Building. Reference, Govindia, Srila, journalist, deceased. When and how, said O'Hara. Died this morning, death recorded, 11.30am local time, Hammersmith Hospital, London, England. Cause of death, autoimmune disease. OK, said O'Hara. Memo to all departments, special attention, social and biological stock acquisition. Attach copies of the article and get a hard copy for me. Contents of memo, prompted Jack Blood politely, waving his knives, dancing impatiently as near to the couch as he could get, straining like a guard dog on a leash. Enclose a memo with the article, requesting that everyone keeps their eyes open for any signs of unusual... 
waiting, prompted Jack after a moment. Blood tests, said O'Hara. All blood tests conducted by Biostock Acquisitions. Paste in that article you just read and cross-reference with the database and see if there's any more technical literature you can pull out. Make a list of the blood proteins and tell acquisition to test for them. If we find any stock reading positive, skip processing and fly them straight out here from the King Building. Put a priority on this and offer a bonus. The usual 10% plus 7 points in the company health scheme. Filed, ready for action tomorrow, said Jack. He swept his failed stick arms upward, knives clutched in black twig fingers. With a swooping motion, he brought both arms swinging inwards and drove the blades through the black felt of his own jacket. He lifted his arms free and showed the knives jutting out of his wooden scarecrow torso. He took a bow and disappeared back into the B&O. O'Hara sipped his coffee. It was cold. There was snow falling in New York. When Mancuso looked up, the sky seemed to be a low grey ceiling. All the lights of the city were being reflected back off some kind of diffuse low cloud. It wasn't a true night sky at all. It was like being inside a metal tunnel. The only thing which gave an impression of depth was the slow vertical descent of the snow, drifting downwards towards her face. When Mancuso was a child, she would have opened her mouth to catch a flake on her tongue. She didn't do that now. Mancuso watched the street while McKilveen secured the riot gun and locked the car. In this neighbourhood, a police car was a target. The food was good here, though. McKilveen came around the car and she let him lead the way towards the diner. When his boot hit the iced sidewalk, he slid, swore and would have gone down on his ass if Mancuso hadn't caught his arm. The waitress serving at the counter had a little silver cross pinned to the white collar of her jacket, right beside the small flag badge that signified membership of the Young Republicans. Mancuso let her pour the coffee before she said, There's two things I normally never talk about. Hey, come on, don't start, said McKilveen. I beg your pardon, said the waitress looking at Mancuso. Religion and politics, said Mancuso. Normally, I never talk about those two subjects. But listen, do you think the president will go to hell? She smiled sweetly at the waitress. The woman put their tab down and left, heading back to the kitchen. Why did you have to do that, said McKilveen. She's just a kid, probably takes it all very seriously. Nobody's young enough to be that stupid. On a rooftop across the street, Lewis Christian took off his headphones. He immediately regretted it. The foam pads had been shielding his ears from the bite of the cold air. Mulray didn't seem to be bothered by the cold. He was standing beside Christian, his camel hair coat dusted with snow. Lewis was pleased to see that somehow he'd managed to get up the fire escape without putting a black smear on it. Well, what do you think? said Christian. Is Chuck going to hell? Mulray just smiled. He took the rifle bag from Christian and unzipped it. The stock of the rifle was textured grey plastic with dimpled buttons under the barrel for control of the optical system. Mulray sighted it on the warm glow of the diner window on the street opposite. The soft plastic shroud of the eyepiece formed a warm seal against his cheek. The telescopic sight brought the cop's face sharply into view. First, the woman. She was grinning. Mulray removed the barrel of the rifle. The sight lost focus, then gained it again as it tightened on the image of the male cop. Mulray leaned over the edge of the rooftop, making small adjustments on the rifle, swinging it back and forth from the man to the woman. In the warmth of his kitchen, O'Hara sat looking at the two dossiers in front of him, studying the pictures. He was coming to a decision when the telephone rang. He took the call in the living room, routing it through the B&O. The wall opposite the big picture window lit up as the image of the callers was projected on it, flat. Northern Global hadn't yet attempted to deliver holographic images over the phone fibres. It was a conference call, three separate images appearing in squares on the walls, like portraits without frames. Each image stabilised at a different rate, 
coming in over different routes via satellites, then through Northern Global's landlines. The first caller was an Oriental woman. She was calling from an office. O'Hara could see some of the equipment on her desk at the edge of the image. She said nothing, not even looking up into the phone, continuing to work at something while waiting for the conference circuit to complete. The second caller was young, perhaps 16. He was dressed in a bathrobe, hair wet from a shower. He greeted O'Hara, combing his hair while he waited for the call to begin. The third image remained a blank square of mint green. O'Hara couldn't tell if it was the wall behind the phone or some kind of computer-generated blind. Finally, a woman stepped into frame. O'Hara didn't recognise her. Hello, can you hear me? Who exactly are you? said the oriental woman on the wall above, looking up from her desk for the first time. I'm Mr Pegram's physician. How is he? said the teenage boy. I'm afraid Mr Pegram died today. Again, said the boy. The physician seemed to take this personally. Mr Pegram has only died twice since I assumed supervision of his health control programme. We haven't got all day, said the oriental woman. Or all night, said the boy, speaking from the other side of the world. All I'm asking is that you don't excite or disturb Mr Pegram too much. The physician's image disappeared, replaced by Pegram himself, sitting upright in his medical harness. As far as O'Hara could tell, he looked a little healthier than usual, if anything. "'What's she been telling you, that quack?' boomed Pegram. His speech was deep, mellow and virile, the synthesised voice of a young man, licensed from some popular entertainer of ten years ago, and now controlled directly from what was left of Pegram's larynx. "'As much as I would love to discuss your health, Jack, there are other things which require my attention,' said the woman. "'Will you be represented at Brussels?' said the boy." My delegates can meet your delegates, the woman continued working while she spoke. Obviously this is a very busy time and a critical time. Well, let's hear it then, said Pegram. His old eyes stared at O'Hara over his plastic oxygen mask. Progress report, boy. We are very close to completion, said O'Hara. The mountain bunker will be finished by the end of the year. Is it going to be secure, said Pegram. My engineers tell me that it will survive a small-scale nuclear strike or any earthquake activity that is likely to arise in this region. So how long will the thing last? The hardware is all self-supporting. My engineers see no reason why it shouldn't last indefinitely. Indefinitely, said Pegram. It was hard to tell, but he might have been smiling behind the oxygen mask. This is all secondary, said the oriental woman. The vital aspect is the success of the software. How close are we to an assessment of that? We'll be obtaining the final test subject tonight, said O'Hara. Call me when you have some results. The image went blank as the woman hung up. The boy shrugged. Call me also, he said, and the second square of light faded on the wall. Only Pegrim was left, staring out from the living room wall. In the late night quiet of the dark room, O'Hara could hear noises from Pegram now, his machines breathing for him. This is a splendid enterprise, said the old man. God will smile upon it. Unable to move his remaining arm, he just winked at O'Hara before the computer hung up for him. O'Hara continued looking at the blank dark wall for a moment, considering the lingering traces the phone light had left on his vision. Then he went into the kitchen. He deliberately didn't look at the two pieces of paper lying on the counter. O'Hara took a sweet pastry from the refrigerator and put it in the oven to warm up. As he did so, he came to a decision. He picked up the kitchen phone, a handset, and called New York. The bean curd satay had smelled good. McKilveen had been worried that the waitress might have taken some kind of revenge on them, sabotage in the kitchen, but the food had been fine. That was just like McKelveen, thought Mancuso, always worrying. She sat at the counter, still shaking a little. The waitress was clutching Mancuso's hand in her own, gripping it fiercely. Mancuso let her. She figured it would make the waitress feel better. There was blood on the girl's tunic, a splash of it beside the little silver cross. The waitress had done surprisingly well. She hadn't panicked. 
She had been on the phone almost immediately, calling for medical assistance while Mancuso had been on the floor with McKilveen. The paramedics' feet were crunching on broken glass now. They had arrived with unbelievable speed, considering the snow and the traffic. OK, now, said one of the paramedics. They braced themselves and lifted the stretcher off the floor. It was a life support stretcher, and McKilveen was already connected up to it. Mancusa got up to follow it out of the door, but one of the other cops stopped her, made her sit back down at the counter. The waitress took Mancuso's hand again, and Mancuso let her. The plates of satay were turning to cold grease on the counter. Snow and cold air blew in through the shattered window of the diner. Mancuso could see the lights of the police copter as it hovered above the building across the street, sweeping the roof with a search beam. And there was nothing there. The snipers would be miles away by now. When the traffic had eased, the first paramedic glanced into the back of the ambulance. The policeman was attached to the vehicle's life support, the stretcher locked down onto the body table. The second paramedic was busy making adjustments to the drug supply. How is he? All brain functions seem okay? Thank God for that. The second paramedic made a last check on the vital signs readout and came forward, climbing into the passenger seat. He clipped his seatbelt on and looked across at the driver. That was a terrific shot, he said. Well, I couldn't let us freeze on that rooftop all night, said Mulray.